Hello and welcome. Um, my name is Corey Benke. I am the co-founder of LiveX. We're a broadcast services company out of New York City. I also am the lead producer of New Year's Eve in Times Square, um, the official webcast. Today we are talking about transmission. Yay. Um, uh, Eric and I came up with a beautiful title, Bridging the Invisible Wall Between Your Show and Your Viewer. And I actually have a really excellent panel today. Um, Mark East is the executive director of, for live event operations for iStream Planet. Alden Fertig uh, has been with Ustream for a long time and is currently the vice president of product marketing. Peter Hartz uh, with The Switch, VP of Sales. And Gus Elliott, uh, he's the senior director of video operations and technology at Silver Chalice. And we actually have a running thread for the last month or so, talking about what we wanted to talk about today. And I came up with a list of, of seven points, starting with fiber and satellite, IP transport, cellular bonding, and unlicensed RF. And for me, um, I felt like the, the best use of this time was how can I, as a live producer, get that last mile if I don't have internet? to my client, right? How do I get to Ustream? How do I get to my platform? How do, how do I get um, my program feed, my remote, to where it needs to go so it can get encoded um, to my client? And there was, it was really interesting, about a, uh, two weeks ago, I had a client, International Center for Sport and Security, which is owned by the Qatari government, and I was literally laughing when I was hired, I was, I was like, oh man, I can talk about this on the panel in two weeks. Um, we had to get to Qatar, uh, two remote feeds, and we also streamed to Ustream. And when we showed up at 68th Street and uh, Lexington Avenue, Park Avenue, the lady at the Council on Foreign Relations said, yeah, we don't have internet. <laughs> I was like, uh, you know we're streaming tomorrow, right? And she's like, yeah, um, we're sorry. We, we get attacked by China every day, and we don't allow third parties to get on our, our network. So I ended up having to get a satellite truck, and I uplinked. So it was a $15,000 charge to uplink, downlink to AMV26 and encode to Ustream so that 350 people could watch the stream. Um, and that's kind of an extreme use case, but it kind of shows that we need solutions for people um, that when we don't have internet. And there are a lot out there, and I think there's a lot of pitfalls um, and we're gonna, one of the big things we're going to talk about today is cellular bonding because I feel like a lot of people here are probably like, hey, I want to use cellular bonding. What are the things I should really think about? So my first question is going to be to Alden. Um, Alden, what are, at Ustream, because you guys have so many clients and you have so many streams every day, when someone doesn't have internet, what is the first thing you recommend for them to get that last mile to, um, to get to encode? Well, first thing is we recommend they get internet, but, <laughs> <laughs> but assuming that that's uh, you know not entirely possible, we kind of we kind of go down the range of options. So, you know, of course, a, a wired you know solid dedicated connection is is best, and uh, we were just discussing this. You know, also really making sure that understanding that there's differences between different types of internet, understanding what sort of uh, what sort of network policies are in place because. Even when you do have internet, a lot of times it'll be the, the network policies that are going to really damage your uh, event, even, even if there's tons of bandwidth and all that. Um, the other thing that we look at a lot is, is what other options do you have? So for example, you mentioned cellular bonding. And even outside of cellular bonding, sometimes people can do something on a singular cellular connection, even with no bonding. And um, so obviously there's, there's solutions for that. So we see people using Teradek. We see people using LiveView, and we see people using even a laptop with a 4G, 4G stick. 4G card. Yeah. yeah. Um, Mark, so iStream Planet, you guys do some of the biggest events in the world. What are, what are some technologies you guys are utilizing in the field for those events that you feel comfortable, right? Not, not fiber or satellite right now, that you feel comfortable where you're like, yeah, this is OK. I'm going to deploy this on the ground as my primary form of transmission. So I, I think, I mean, you hit on something right there. It's really all about comfort level. Um, you know, we, uh, unlike, I mean, we use Ustream, we use YouTube, we use Livestream, we, you know, stream to Twitch, all, all of those uh, platforms. 
And you know, those are focused on kind of making sure that everyone has the ability to ingest in some way, shape, or form. We're, everything I work on is you know, fully managed. So it's all about you know, comfort level and our ability to adhere to an SLA and that sort of thing. So um, at the end of the day, we're looking at you know, fiber, if it's, if it's possible. Uh, satellite would be the, the, you know, the, the second tier. Um, but uh, I was just uh, telling Alden, for a lot of events over the course of about the past year or so, we've, we've had uh, Zixi as our either secondary or tertiary uh, backhaul solution. Um, and in terms of comfort level, it's been fantastic. Uh, it's incredibly robust. We've had, uh, we've had tests going from Northern Africa over 24, 25 hops on the internet with zero packet loss over the course of many months. Um, it's absolutely rock solid. That said, you know, we had a, an event recently <coughs> where we were running it on, a, on an untested network, unmanaged network that was out of our control, and we had some issues with it, so we ended up having to fail over to something else. So, you know, all of these solutions are going to have some pitfalls in one way or another, but um, I think Zixi, uh, Z-I-X-I, if anyone's writing down notes, is um, the, my current favorite IP, you know, unmanaged IP backhaul solution. So Zixi, just so if you don't know what it is, so Zixi is UDP transport. Um, so you basically have to have an encoder, much like a Teradek cube, you have to have an encoder and a decoder in line. Right. Correct. Um, and you still need internet, but, but you're able to, because it's UDP based, you're able to transport um, uh, on networks that you wouldn't normally be able to transport on. Correct. You can transmit uh, transport high data rate yeah. video. So you can transport, you know, say you've got a number of, or, or say you're using a Cellmux solution, or say you're using, you know, some sort of aggregation of, you know, multiple different links, and you've got maybe an aggregate of like six or eight megs. You can transport a, a really, really robust 1080i, uh, 30 at, you know, seven or eight megabits with that connection with zero packet loss, absolutely no issues, because it uses FEC and it uses ARQ and, um, so yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's quite robust. It's actually a good point for if you're going to use satellite, if you're using KA band especially, uh, KA band, you know, you'll get 12 megabit up, but using a UDP transport system is actually a really smart thing to do and not send your encoded stream, you know, your, your, you not send your encoded stream up that way and actually use Zixi instead. That's mm -hmm. actually a, a really good, a good point. Um, and Zixi has really low latency. Um, a lot of platforms are using it for, for that. So I want to go to Peter. A lot of people in this country have no idea what fiber is. Even people like myself who, who and, and so a lot of people don't realize, for, for me, I use fiber at Times Square and I, AMV has a, a patch panel sure. to themselves and I pay about $3,000, which a lot of people are like, oh, that's a little expensive. but. You know, if I had to get a sat truck, that'd be 4,500. Then I got to pay for space. That's 600 an hour plus wherever I got to get it to go, right? And so for me, uh, for New Year's, we use the fiber patch panel. And what's also good is I can get it out to Encompass. I can, by using the switch, I can get it out to anywhere in the world. Right. So talk to me about fiber. And also, I don't think a lot of people understand its availability in the US and, that, and, it, and it, it's highly available. Right. I mean, the main challenge on any transmission is always that first mile. And so um, the, con the carriers, the LEX, they offer video services on fiber. So for example, the switch, we have national agreements with AT&T, Verizon, CenturyLink, Cox, and a range of others. So what we do is we buy those video circuits wholesale and then sell them at less than tariff. And so, for example, uh, if you saw the opening um, uh, session by Corey Smith, where he talked about you know, Microsoft Production Studios in Redmond. So while we're doing this conference, we're doing one right now, where in Washington is the Microsoft Government Cloud Forum. And so to do that, there's a Verizon first mile video circuit, which is an uncompressed HD 1.485 gig native format HD, so out of the camera, you're sending native HD, and then that goes to the DC switch, which is one of the 47 cities on our national network that's connected by a 20 gig mesh network. And at the other end, that would go to the Seattle switch, and then it would go on a 10 gig local loop 
to Microsoft at Redmond where we would have a, where we have a Nimbra 680. So we have a Nimbra platform in these 47 cities and then we have hundreds of circuits connected to each one of those city pops. And so typically if you're in a city and you need to do an event from a, from a, a, a remote, you can get it. So today, that forum that we're talking about, that's from the Ronald Reagan Building in Washington, Verizon Local Loop Circuit, and they're also using satellite as a backup, both going back to Redmond. So fiber is very present, very available, and uh, really you know, should be looked at as a first solution. Um, it's typically less expensive than if you had to bring a SAT truck. The Microsoft event, they want belt and suspenders, so they've got the fiber and they've got the SAT truck. So um, there's a whole range of, of uh, transmission opportunities. And, and the type of transmission you can do, um, it could be straight broadcast quality video that you're acquiring. It could be that you, you're encoding in some way and you want to send ethernet you know, point to point to, to, your, to your vendor. There's a lot of... Um, uh, ways to connect from the remote location to your encoding vendor who's going to then up to your CDNs. And, and it is very economical. I mean, that, that's one of my uh, things when I first, uh, about four years ago when I was at Livestream, we actually put a, we put a switch connection in to our, our control uh, center. And it's only $1,000 a month for, in New York, I don't know what it is everywhere, but you know, if you, if you price that over the year, it's it's really reliable too. That's my, my favorite thing about it. And you can send it anywhere. Like I could send, I could send a feed we were doing and send it to uh, Los Angeles and you know, it, it was economical to do so. So um, I, I definitely highly recommend fiber. Um, the problem that most of us in this room probably have is that our client doesn't get to us until a week before. And so we can't really get fiber and turn on fiber in the time that it takes. Um, but I've been really excited that, that if we could just have fiber in more places, the world would be a better place for myself and for a lot of people in this room. Um, so Gus, I want to talk about cellular bonding. Sure. Because I think everybody really wants to know what we should use when it comes to cellular bonding. Um, you know, Alden made a good point. Some people just use a 4G card. Um, I did that for a Lady Antebellum concert one time in Chicago because I didn't have bonding and I lost internet and it went off okay. Now, when you have Ustream, which one of the things that Ustream does really well is they actually transcode, um, so you can, I can just send a two megabit stream. When I was with Livestream, we actually had to send four qualities, so we were always asking for five megabit, um, which is a little bit more difficult. When I only have to send up two megabit on a 4G card, I think that's actually a little bit less risky. Um, but uh, Gus, tell, talk to me about cellular bonding. What do you guys use in the field that, um, that works? Sure. And uh, what, what do you recommend for people to use for their live event? Um, today we use the LiveView backpack. We stream, we, so we stream various events for collegiate athletic departments and schools. Um, and in the instance they don't have internet, which frankly is not very many. For, the, like for instance, for college football playoff, we send them a LiveView backpack and they stream with a LiveView backpack back to a decoder where we encode it and deliver it. So you use a LiveView server at the MCR? Right. Yeah. And then is LiveView the only solution you use? LiveView is the only solution we currently use. Interesting. And Mark, do you have the same? You, you mostly use LiveView for? Yeah, when it comes to cellular bonding, I mean, there's a, there's a whole bunch of you know, players out there. Now, we, we have used uh, Teradex bond solution uh, with, with good results. Um, but I mean, LiveView is kind of the 800-pound gorilla. Uh, the, the thing I like about LiveView, like I was mentioning earlier, is you know maybe maybe in your pre-production conversations, you know the the venue contact is telling you, yeah, we don't really have internet for you to use. You're going to have to bring your own solution, blah blah blah. But when you end up on site, you got some you know tech who says, oh no, I can give you internet. That's no problem. And we also have Wi-Fi. Oh, and there's a WiMAX tower over there, and a, there's a this and a that. So you end up with one live view backpack being able to use, let's say, six, eight cellular modems plus the hotel's Wi-Fi plus the hardline connection they're giving you plus maybe WiMAX. There's a, just a number of different ways that you can get 
connectivity to it, and it's really good at managing the bonded throughput. Mm -hmm. um, so you can end up, you know, I've done events at, I did an event in, at the Fontainebleau in Miami um, that was, you know, the hotel's here, the beach is here. I couldn't make a phone call. So the, the cellular part of it wasn't doing too well, but that combined with the hotel's Wi-Fi and the hard line that I had from the hotel, I could get about seven or eight megs. So I had my pick of what I wanted to be able to push back to our Bach in Las Vegas. Um, worked, worked very, very well. Whereas if you have a, a solution that is entirely cellular based, that's your only option. And if you have a bunch of what I like to call, you know, big walking wet bags of water, uh, in, the, in the room, you're not going to have a whole uh, uh, great uh, uh, result. Um, Gus, do you guys use any other solutions for transmission that you'd, you'd recommend? We do. So where we're at today is, well, one of our advantages is we generally have a fair amount of time when we work with a school to, to get them up and running. But, you know, we work with everybody from Notre Dame on the high end to somebody like Bucknell on the low end. And, you know, a couple of offshoots in there like Navy who won't let us have an internet connection. So we work with everything from, we use Teradek Cube in a lot of cases. Um, we have installed LTN, which is an, an IP to fiber solution. And so what's that? It's a um, encoder decoder solution. It's, fi it's IP for the first mile. And then it goes on their own rented fiber backbone. Gotcha. And we deliver that to, we have, we have a couple of different products. We have, we have products for web and mobile and tablet, and we have other products that we deliver to, to over-the-top providers, guys like Go90 and Sling TV. And they want, their, they want their content in a little more traditional television fashion than just you know, delivering an RTMP feed to somebody. So for those, we have, we have you know, use somebody like LTN who's able to you know, deliver a higher quality signal than just a Teradek is able to. And what's the cost on something like that? Um, we're paying about three grand a month. And, the, and you get the encoder decoder? Well, no, the encoder decoder was something like 20. Mm. And then on top of that, you have a just a, a per, event, per month cost. Gotcha. Which brings me to my point. like. What's really interesting and fascinating about transmission to me is that the further we get away from satellite to try to save money, the closer we get to spending money. <laughs> like, it, it, it's mind boggling. It's like, if I, I, can put a, I can put a satellite truck on the ground, right? I can do, for $4,500 or less, depending, I can, I can get guys to compete against each other. Depending on what market you're in, you might be in a market that only has PSSI or they have to travel, so it might be more expensive. But, but then I have to pay for the hourly, and you, you put it all in your head, and you're like, okay, I'm $10,000 in, or I'm $15,000 in. But at the same time, like, uh, like Teradek, we, we actually talked about this earlier, with the cube, with the IP transport. Now, granted, you have to give that internet. Right? Sure. So you're, still, you're still in that piece. But as far as IP transport goes, that's actually a very cost-effective uh, solution, I think everybody would agree with. And we were talking about the LiveView pack, where you know, you're $7,000 in on a LiveView, even on the smaller one. Now you have monthly services for the cell. Um, and you know you're, you're going to want to do AT&T, T-Mobile. Mm -hmm. You're going to have all of them, right? So that's $100 for each one of those providers. So. But the, the nice thing to mention about that, not to interrupt, yeah, but, yeah. but with a live view pack, they'll, they'll rent it to you. And I, I believe it's a thousand yes, bucks. Yes, it's about a thousand dollars. Yes. For, for like a four or five day period. And that comes with, I think, six different carriers, yeah. modems plugged right into the unit and you're done. And I think they charge you a little, I think they charge you overages for what you use. If you go over a certain Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, I, and, and I will say, I've had a lot of success with live view. I've had a lot of failures with live view, but I've been using live view for about five years. So I think most of my failures were, were, were four or five years ago. Like I, I did a Daughtry concert in New York. We had the typical thing for me with LiveView and with, with all cellular bonding and for live event producers. And the problem is, is that everything works when you test it, when there's nobody in the room. And then as soon as people show up and start using their cell phones and doing their stuff, it becomes this like, ah, it's going crazy. And I had, I had three failures with LiveView. And it's, it's no fault of LiveView. It's more the technology. Um, so, Peter, what are you seeing your clients, what, what are, where are you seeing growth in fiber, and what are some of the exciting things that are happening in the space, 
you know, so that more people like myself and, and quite honestly, people that are producing um, live events, like, like what's, what's coming up? You know, one of the, one of the things that, uh, it's really actually a really exciting time. There's, there's so much change going on and with the change comes chaos, but also tremendous opportunity. Um, one of the things that we're seeing on the production side is something that we're referring to as home runs. So as an example, we have a customer, Univision, who um, airs soccer games, airs all the MLS soccer games. So the traditional model of production is that you send everybody to the venue, uh, the director, all the editorial people, all the production people, and you make a show and then you have that show come out on one cable and maybe go to the satellite truck and go to the fiber truck. What, what's happening now is realizing that um, what we're doing for Univision is instead of that, the director stays home. The crew stays home in Miami. Sleep in their own bed. The A-team can come to work every day, knock show out after show. And what we're doing is bringing all the camera feeds back individually, one for one protected on the fiber, back to Miami. Sending also cameras back to the venue, having ethernet connection that let them do tallies and all the normal things they'd have in production. And because of this, they're cutting the show back home. So we call that at home production. But what I think that creates is a tremendous opportunity for the streaming community, because if you think of all of those feeds, what you could do with those, you could, instead of them falling to the floor after the director's picked which ones he wants, you could have those be available in a, in a streaming world. So that's incredibly powerful. One of the things that is futuristic that, that is coming, and actually there's a, there was a demo today um, from a company called Net Insight um, that that is an OTT Live demo, which is attempting, which is offering a solution to synchronize the broadcast signal with the online OTT signals. So that creates what you saw Microsoft was doing, where that real interactive capability, the ability to switch away, switch back. So I think that I think the future is incredibly uh, exciting in terms of what the capabilities are now uh, and, and how they're going to evolve. One of, uh, one of the other things I haven't mentioned yet is microwave. We, we, I, I haven't touched on it, but one of the things, you know, another solution in your tool bag, there are companies out there where you can, if you can see the Empire State Building, for instance, if you can see a canyon in Las Vegas, a, a mountain, uh, you can get internet. Um, the, one of the companies called Airband is out there, and they do a lot of uh, a microwave. Um, Gus, you guys use microwave? We do not. I, I haven't used microwave before. And are you guys are using like what? Are you guys using satellite or fiber? Um, we're using fiber occasionally. We we use fiber for a game from Qualcomm like two weekends ago. Uh huh. So, but our our goal is to get this stuff down as cheap as possible, which pretty much eliminates some of this stuff. And then talk to me a little bit about what do you do to ensure that, let's say you have network capability, right? Mm -hmm. What do you do to ensure that you have, like what Alden said in the beginning, which is, you know, you might have internet, but all internet is not created equal. Sure. What do you do to make sure you have the right um, network? We work, with, we work with our schools to you know, require a dedicated line that comes into the venue that we're gonna be streaming out of. And we do that at each of their venues. Um, in some instances, a school will fiber stuff back to a central location and stream things from there. So it's usually one of, two thi one of those two things. For instance, at Notre Dame, we have, a, a, we have two spinnaker of the old inlets. Wow, spinnaker inlet. That are due in in codes out of there, and we just we have a a business class Comcast circuit in there. Gotcha, gotcha. Alden, what do you see as? I mean, what do you tell people when they're like, "I have no internet"? Well, I think that, I think there's two things, and it's you know we were talking a little bit before about okay, you know there's there's all ends of the spectrum, right? So we're talking everything from. <laughs> from someone who wants to do something on a single 4G stick all the way through, okay, 
can we afford four different methods? And like you said, the belt and suspenders where we have a sat truck plus fiber plus different things. The thing that's universal across all of them, and I think anyone who has experience doing this can attest to it, is you have to test and you have to have lots of backups. Because no matter how, you know, no matter what someone told you, <laughs> it doesn't matter what someone told you, it matters what you actually can experience. And so, you know, even if someone tells you there's a dedicated connection, you need to actually see what that connection is like. Um, we've seen, you know, we're talking, you know, we're talking here about sat trucks. One of the one of the big disadvantages to some degree is that they're charging you by the minute. And you know, I've watched an Apple event where their sat truck cut off. <laughs> like literally, they couldn't finish the event. I've done so many events where there was a 15-minute testing window that somebody paid for on a sat truck. Unfortunately. No one else was ready to test except for the guys in the sad truck, so you know you 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 wasted that that time. So I think the one thing that's universal is no matter what your budget is or what your venue is or what your experience is, it's all about test, 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 and it's all about redundancy, failovers, backups. And so if you can keep those principles in mind, then you can be successful. You know, again, you can be very scrappy and do something with with whatever you have. But the difference between people that pull off successful events and people who you know, have some, some mishaps is usually it's a lack of testing, a lack of preparation, and just no backup. So you know, don't trust. We've seen people put a lot of faith in, you know, I've heard some funny things like, well, it's a brand new computer. It's like, <laughs> yeah, well, that's probably why it's not working well yeah. for you, because you, know, you haven't actually had a chance to test it out yet. Or, or you know, I spent this much money on this thing. Or, I paid this person or this guy told me something and it doesn't, you know, it matters what you can actually experience and what you can prove through, through practice as opposed to, um, you know, what, what somebody might have told you. Well, and to that point, I think that's a really good point of even if you have no money, you have enough money to have a 4G card as your backup. So even if you've got internet at the venue, I always, like right now in my bag, I have an AT&T card. Uh, I actually a Verizon 4G card. So I can still get a signal out even if there's something. There's some kind of backup, right? Um, you want to say something? Well, I mean, on the, on the backup, I'm, the, the event that, uh, that we were just participated in um, on October 25th was the Buffalo Bills, Jacksonville Jaguars NFL game from Wembley. And that was uh, done for Yahoo. Um, and there's an example of somebody who, you know, um, had, I mean, candidly had paid 20 million bucks to the NFL for the rights for that football game. And you can imagine how much they wanted to make certain everything went well. And so they had, you know, multiple fiber paths uh, where we took from, from, um, from Wembley through BT Tower, London Switch to New York. Then they have master controls that were in Atlanta and Stamford through Encompass. And so delivered the signals to there. The pre and post shows came from uh, Sunnyvale, Yahoo Sunnyvale, to both those locations. NFL Culver City fed the halftime show into both those locations. And so then ultimately, Rich Yahoo Richardson, in, which is in Texas, and Yahoo Sunnyvale in California each received four fiber feeds inbound and four satellite feeds inbound. Mm. I was about to say, they had satellite as and a then, too, because somebody then, might cut that line, you know. Yeah, and, and so, cuts that line. and so. then the end result was, I mean, I was, uh, you know, I was at uh, breakfast and had my phone propped up on the salt shaker, and I watched that football game, and it was great. It was great. I was in a hotel, I was in a lobby, had a good internet connection, and I enjoyed watching the game on my phone. So that, you know, that's, that's really something. But behind the scenes, and you'll hear more about that, I'm sure, because you know, the keynote tomorrow is, is uh, Umar from, from Yahoo. And Chris Magnum is, is doing a, on one session here. He's with Yahoo Richardson. But uh, that, was, that was powerful for me as a user. I mean, I was sweating bullets on the other stuff, but watching that was exciting. Mark, um, talk, to, talk to us about some of your, you know, in that redundancy framework, you guys do huge events. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of redundancy are you looking for? What kind are you selling to your clients? And what makes you be able to sleep at night? 
Well, again, I, I think it depends on the, the type of the event, the budget, obviously, the, the you know, comfort level of the customer and how much they're putting into the planning of the backhaul solution and that sort of thing. Um, I think one of the, one of the key things to, to bear in mind when we're talking about fiber is the fact that, like you mentioned before, um, with fiber and, and to an extent with a lot of IP-based technologies versus satellite specifically, you're not necessarily paying by the minute. If you have like a local cross-connect on fiber, you have a private always up fiber circuit, um, you can you know, rehearse when you want to, you can test you know, all day and all night if you want to, whereas satellite, you know, you're paying by the, at least by the 15 minute block um, and uh, that, can, that can get very expensive if things uh, don't go well or if you have a client who's not quite ready to test or you know, that sort of thing. So important to note, um, you know, and, and, and we'll take that in, into consideration a lot when we're planning these uh, you know, backhaul scenarios. Uh, we'll, we'll include fiber if we think that there's going to be some, let's say, flexibility to the schedule of the event. Mm -hmm. um, it's a lot easier to, to manage that way than with, uh, than with satellite. And I think it's also important to note, I wanted to, to mention this, that all of these technologies are a lot less expensive than they were. Oh, five yeah, years there's ago. no doubt. There's no you know doubt. I mean? There's no doubt. I mean, whether you're talking about fiber or satellite or IP, you know, very frequently, like you mentioned, we, I can, you know, I can get an IP technology through, um, I think WebPass is, is the company that we've been using a lot lately for the fixed wireless microwave type stuff. Well, I mean, they're, they're great. They're fantastically, uh, they're always redundant. Their stuff just works. It's fantastic. But I'll pay six or $7,000 for 10 megs for the day. For the day. That's NAB and prices. And so it's all, right. And so it's all day and all night, and it's great, and it's robust, and I can do whatever I want with it. But it is relatively expensive. Whereas, like you say, I could get a, an HD truck somewhere for as little as $3,000 you know, space for as little as, you know, if it's nine megs, it's like 150 to $200 an hour. Yeah. That's pretty cheap when you can, you know, compare it to that. And that's satellite. That's what everyone, you know, perceives as being this incredibly expensive technology. It's not anymore. And neither is fiber. Um, so important to note there. But yeah, I think in terms of increasing our comfort level, um, we, we like to have, like I, like I said, Fiber, fiber is, is king for us still. If we can, you know, if we've got fiber in the building or we've got a nice long lead time and we can drop a loop into the building and, and manage it, I think that's the key is that it's, it's under our control, completely under our control, whereas satellite to a great extent is not. Mm -hmm. Internet certainly is not, especially if you're, you know, getting it from a convention center or a hotel or a sports, you know, arena, that type of thing. You lose your your element of control, and that that I think more than anything is key for us. Which, with higher budgeted clients, that's very important to have. Do you guys are you guys using KA band? I want to talk about KA band satellite. If those of you that don't know, there's you know you basically have C band, um, which is the de facto backup of all backups of satellite service. I actually saw Fox go to their C-band service. You could tell because it turned into SD. Uh, this was like a month <laughs> ago. Um, it, it was snow. Oh, no, it was, like, it was like rain. It was really bad rain. Um, and then, of course, uh, KU is the classic. Um, and now with KA-band, you can get 7 to 12 megabit. I have streamed on Livestream and Ustream, and, and it works fairly well using the internet only. So, you know, most KU band, I'm going up video, down video, and then I'm encoding from that, from that point. With KA band, I was really excited because you can have, you know, a, a dish that's this big that you can bring with you. Um, and so for me, I was like, oh, that's really exciting. And now what I'm seeing in the space is that Viasat is the only, I believe they're the only North American provider of KA band or the main one. And um, they don't offer SNG services anymore. Um, you have to use their streaming platform. They have mm -hmm. their own streaming platform. So, do you, are you guys using what, what? Are you guys using KA at all? Um, do you have experience with that? Uh, do you have anything to say I, about I that? I have experience with that, dating way back to you know 15, 16 years ago. And funny, funny enough, it was Viasat hardware that we were using at the time before they built out the platform, before they had a pricing model. Um, and you know, yeah, we 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 have used it a couple times recently. It's still kind of un untested, untried, it's very new technology. Their management of their network is, is uh, relatively new, so. Do you use it for data primarily or use it for video too? 
We well, the, the like 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 are, like are you just using it for to get data up and down? I mean, granted, video it's data. Both, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but at, at, where, whereas I, I guess I, let me rephrase that. So you know, Ku, I send up, I send up a um, ASI. Uh, sure. Encoded feed. I bring down an ASI encoded feed. Right. I then re-encode that to whatever UStream, LiveStream, what have you. With KA, what I was finding is I've, I've done this a couple times where I don't have to send an ASI feed. I can basically just encode straight to UStream or straight to LiveStream. So I can right. just use just use the encoded data. You know, internet basically. Yep. Hey, I think, I, I think the, of the two times we've used it recently, one was for YouTube. So we were pushing out two, I think, four megabit, you know, primary backup to YouTube. And then the other time we used Zixi uh, to backhaul to Vegas. So, um, and both times it worked great. And then did you just rent those? I yeah. mean, yeah. gotcha. From on a, per, on a per event basis, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. And what did you find the cost of that was? God, I can't even remember. I think per event it ended up being, it was pretty reasonable. It was less than three grand um, for the whole thing with all the service and everything, so. That's one of the, it's one of the technologies I'm most excited about um, for transmission because you have such a small, um, package, mm -hmm. and actually, I did some AMC's um, uh, web chats, and we ended up having to use KA to get out because they didn't have internet. Right. So we would put them on the roof, and that's one of the few things you can actually put on the roof. Um, so fiber, satellite, IP transport, Ethernet, cellular bonding, will. Cellular bonding. Okay, so unlicensed RF. Let's let's get to uh, <laughs> licensed and unlicensed RF. Very exciting. Um, so I stream in Times Square all the time. I actually just used. I bought a Teradek um, Bolt 600. I own the regular and the 600, and it worked really well in Times Square. I couldn't believe it, and I think even my friends at Teradek couldn't believe it um, because that's a really <laughs> hard space to deal with and. Uh, uh, it worked great. We, we, they actually built a soccer field on between 43 and 44, and our OB truck was on 42 and 43, and I had to get across the street, and that was literally the only way I could get across the street. Um, so, you know, the bolt aside, have you guys had any experience with unlicensed or licensed uh, RF devices that you would recommend for um, transmission or for even just, you know, getting wireless cameras to and from each other. And you know, it used to be seven, eight years ago, I spent $25,000 to get uh, a camera, a straight up RF on the back of a camera licensed. Mm -hmm. That was just the rental. That was not like buying anything. Um, do you guys have any experience with, uh, with that that you'd recommend? I'm a, we should probably go down the line. I'm, I'm a big fan of Teradek. I love the Bolt products and yeah, they, they work great. Yeah, a lot of our a lot of our customers are using various combinations of Teradek products, and we don't always have visibility into what you know. I don't know exactly all the which solutions they're using, but we find that Teradek products have been very popular our customers. From you know, they have a range of things, and they're very flexible. And we were talking about Live View earlier. Occasionally, people will use something like a Live View because they can get it on that rental model, and if they just kind of don't really want to have to you know worry about it. That's fine, but we have a lot of customers that also use Teradek because they prefer the flexibility of all the different products. They can mix and match different things. They're sort of a Swiss Army knife, so they're tremendously popular with our customers, and there's a lot of different things you can do with them, particularly around wireless cameras, even if you don't use them for the actual internet connection. We've also used the Bolt for, for sports productions, and it's been great. Anything else, like Box or DeGero? Any, Anybody have any kind of experience with that? I myself have not um, had a lot of experience. I remember I used to use BSI, which I know is uh, was at the time 2.5 gigahertz, which it seems like everybody's operating in this 2.5 and 5 gigahertz mm -hmm. spectrum, which I think is actually really dangerous in some ways because everybody's on Wi-Fi, yeah. and that's kind of the same <laughs> area. And I've been hearing about 5.8, and I've been and you know for me because I'm a huge idiot. Um, I have been trying to license, there's this new, um, the GoPro has, uh, VizLink has a receiver for the GoPro, right? So a $400 camera, you, for the low price of $8,000, <laughs> can buy a uh, transmitter, and then for the low price of $12,000, you can buy a receiver. But here's the kick. If you don't have a broadcast license with the FCC, you actually can't use the product which is insane to me. So there's this, there's this, 
you know, we're, we're talking about transmission and one of the things I didn't want to miss is that the FCC and the government have allowed the broadcasters to have all of this beautiful licensed spectrum and the rest of us down here, the peasants, get, you know, <laughs> The, the unlicensed white space where all the startups live and it's, it's becoming increasingly more difficult for us, in the, I feel like, in the wireless space. I feel like even Teradex products, I love them, but I feel like they're pushing against a wall where yeah. the spectrum is getting like this. You know, even on, on wireless mics, I know we're not talking about wireless necessarily, but I have you know, many uh, sure uh, UR4D products and the J3 space and the L3 space, it's insane. There's, there's <laughs> huge, like you do the test and there's like bands of FCC licensed space that is for broadcasters that aren't even using it. Um, sorry, that was a little tangent, but, um, <laughs> but it is ridiculous. Well, to, to bring the tangent back, I think, you know, in terms of like products like Bolt, uh, we had an event recently in, in, uh, in Manhattan where there, there was plenty of internet inside this hotel that we were adjacent to, but there was no easy way. We, had to, we would have to cross a street and a main, you know, kind of foot traffic thoroughfare to get anything out to us. So Bolt became, we ended up not using it, but, but for a while there we were considering, well, we'll just set up a Bolt Pro, you know, 1000 or something like that from the hotel, shoot it out a window down to us, and we'll have everything that we need right there. Um, and the, the idea was to you know, do the switch outside and then send the program feed directly inside and encode there. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that could work. I mean, that's, you know, so that's, that becomes your first mile or your first 100 feet. Or whatever, yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. Yep. I, um, where, where are we on time? Sorry, I want to make. 11, 12. All right. So I want to talk about microwave. What is your, has been your experience? You know, I think something that gets lost when you guys go out in the field, um, and even me, I'll come to a city and I'll be like, oh, I don't have internet, oh, I need a set truck. Okay, get a set truck. And I don't do my due diligence and I realize that, oh, there is microwave available. Mm -hmm. um, and even in New York, like before there was the Bolt, a lot of times what we'll do just across the street, we'll put up two microwaves and literally just have them looking at each other less than 30 feet from each other, but it's because cars have to go by. Yep. Um, what has been your experience um, on the ground? And you, know, you mentioned one solution you guys use, but depending on where you're at, what, what do you guys typically try to do? For point to point or for internet connection? For point to point and for internet, both, for both. So, so for point to point, we're entirely IP based now. It's all, it's all Bolt, it's all that, that type of stuff. Um, for uh, internet connectivity, like I mentioned, WebPass, TowerStream is big in New York. There's a bunch of different providers. They almost all use the Motorola Canopy platform now because it's super robust and um, it's really easy to configure and it's really easy to, to you know, have multiple redundancy scenarios and that sort of thing. So yeah, that's, that's what we've been using a lot of. And then have you ever thought about, like, is it, is it not cost effective? It's always more cost effective to rent those systems. Have you ever thought about, like, you know, for me, I'm always like, I'm always like KA band. I really want to spend twenty five thousand dollars on a KA band pack, mm -hmm. even before I realize that like I don't have anywhere to put it. You know, because <laughs> it's just exciting for me to be like, hey, I don't have to worry about internet. You know, I can I can get anywhere, yep. right? And there really isn't that solution out there. And even you know, with Viasat, there's you can't do that unless you're you know, like I was saying, it's like broadcasters are here, and then the rest of us are like down here, right? right. As far as like being in that space. You guys, I think, are the closest thing to almost being a broadcaster. I mean, you're owned by Turner, but at the same time, it's like you're, you're doing such big events that I would think that there's some, at some point it becomes cost effective to have your own At some point we can harness paths. that, but the, the, the kind of stuff that we do runs the gamut, absolutely runs the gamut from the tiniest little, like, you know, eSports event that 300 people are watching to, you know, something like the Super Bowl that two point whatever million people are watching. So we, you know, we, we've got a kind of, unfortunately there's no hard and fast rule for any of this stuff. If we were doing a huge series of events, maybe a hundred events over the course of a year or something, each of which was going to have a roughly similar, you know, backhaul scenario and the same types of limitations, then maybe, yeah, we buy a Viasat system and, you know, truck that around the country or something like that. But um, yeah, it's usually more cost effective to rent, especially if you're dealing with various, you know, different scenarios. Would and you that, agree? And that, that's the point. There's such a big range, you know, of, of options. And it ranges also from, you know, the very hairy edge in terms of reliability, 
mm -hmm. rock solid. And so you, you pick where on that continuum you need to be. I mean, one of the things that's, that's, that's new for us that people are asking us is about internet at, like, let's say a pro sports venue. Okay, so we, all of the pro sports venues are on the switch network. You know, NFL, MLB, NHL, NBA, MLS, they're all, all those venues are connected. So we're used to somebody coming to us and talking to us about whether they wanted to do from 4K to 3G to uncompressed HD to SDI to ASI to J2K, and as well as all the Ethernet services they could want to do for point to point for EVS and for all the other types of things. But now we're getting people asking us, well, can you give me an internet connection so I can use my, my device to do this? So, you know, a, let's say, you know, I did this with, you know, TVS Teca wants to do a feed from, you know, AT&T Stadium in Dallas back to Mexico City. And they brought their internet device to do that. So, so what, we, what, we've, the, what we have is we, have the, we access the internet at several locations, East Coast and West Coast, mm -hmm. right? And then we will draw down from there and feed it up to wherever you want it. So he wants it, so there, we have an IO panel in all these venues, you know, with, with RJ45 slots. And so basically he could just plug in there and we'd give him what he wants. So, okay, I want 10 megabits of internet and I want it for four hours. Okay, great. Bingo, you got it. I didn't realize that. I thought that, I thought you guys only offered the uh, the uncompressed. Oh no, no. So it's it's this this is the point. It's the whole range of, of everything, uh, and the biggest growth we're seeing is really in in the Ethernet side, where where people are able to you know if you're if you're CBS and we're doing football for you, you know we'll give you a two gig path between you know broadcast New York and the venue of choice Thursday night football whatever. And then they'll be able to run all of their systems on that kind of thing. So it's a big, it's a big spread and uh, that's, that's one of the things that makes it challenging and interesting. And I think, I think actually that's a really, com I've, uh, the last, since I left live stream and I've been on my own, one of my things in my head has been like, I need to get on the switch. And so the, so the times, <laughs> no, seriously, I'm serious about this. I, I'm a huge nerd. Um, and I've been like, how can I get on the switch and how can I make a compelling argument to my clients that I need to be on the switch? Because for instance, we did uh, Hurricane Sandy Cam and because we were on the switch, we were able to get New York City government feed, we were able to get all these feeds and bring them in and also bring in like people's cell phones from the actual live stream app and it was really compelling content. And so, you know, just having the switch at your facility, I think does open up enormous possibilities I know I'm an ad for the switch right now, but it, it does open up enormous possibilities for smaller broadcasters, for smaller, you know, hey, I'm on the switch, so now I can think about things a little differently because I have fiber at my facility. Um, Gus, what, are, what is one of the kludgiest things you've ever done? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> we, we do kludgy things today. We do, we do old laptops streaming flash media live and oh oh man i was almost, gonna say i was gonna have that that word be banned almost every day wow <laughs> i mean it just depends on the client it just depends on the school and the kind of experience and technology that they have on site mm -hmm. and what what what's something you thought what's something you did as far as transmission that you were like this is not going to work and then it ended up working hmm <laughs> Because I can name like five things. <laughs> um, a lot of this IP stuff from inside a, inside a old venue, a volleyball venue, or out on a baseball field or something like that, some of those you really have to you know, dumb them down until you're sending out like 500K mm. before, my, before they start working. Wow. I, I got a good kludge. Okay. Like I said, I'm a huge fan of Zixi, and normally it works perfectly. One of the nice things I wanted to mention uh, too about Zixi is that it's super extensible. So you could, there, there's a number of different uh, transmission devices and software platforms that support Zixi, like it's built into Wirecast. Yeah. You can buy a Zixi license for all the Teradec encoders, et It's built into Livestream Studio. It's built yeah, into exactly. like, yeah. 
So we had a customer who wanted to use Zixi as their backup backhaul path, and they happened to have a laptop with Wirecast on site. So I sent them the information for our broadcaster, sent them a little instruction sheet, here's how you set it up, you know, send it to us. Uh, what ended up hitting us, they didn't have the right license installed for Wirecast, so that it ended up hitting us as a flash stream, RTMP over Zixi. So it was protected by the FEC and the ARQ, but it ended up on the other end as RTMP, not as a transport stream. So we couldn't take it directly into our system, so what we did was we pushed it out. Zixi has a lovely little feature on its broadcaster side, the, the receive side, where you can just click a link and it'll pop up in a flash player uh, with an accelerated uh, 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 transport into the player. And then you can just you know watch that on the laptop for monitoring purposes. So we just blew that up full screen took a screen grab of, of mm. it using, using a, a, mm, a the old black, screen grab <laughs> trick. Black Magic DVI extender, put that back wow. into our, our main matrix router, into our switch, out to our encode platform, and, and uh, it worked great. <laughs> I think people would be surprised at how many times a broadcast they're looking at is actually a screen grab. Yeah. <laughs> I think people would be very, very surprised. That, that's pretty kludgy. Yeah. Um, yeah. Alden, I, you come on. Uh, you guys have yeah, like a million a streams a day. <laughs> but um, one, one good one is, you know, just to uh, give, a, give a shout to the live UPAC. We had a couple people that did from CES, Oof. walking around the show floor, broadcasted all day with live UPAC. So that one was, that one was pretty... There were certain times. And it worked? Yeah, it worked. Wow. Certain times they go down a certain hallway or something and it would start to like cut out. But they were just like, they were, they were cool that they were like, hey, we want to do the whole show. This was TechCrunch who does a lot of like coverage of different media things and startups. And they said, okay, well, you know, we'll just like be in our ear and tell us if it starts cutting out and then we'll just make sure we walk to a different <laughs> point. But they've done it, I think, three or four years in a row and it works pretty well even there. The other really, um, uh, really amazing one was. Uh, we did a concert with John Mayer a few years ago, and John Mayer's manager at the time, I think it was his manager, basically said she wanted to try to stream it herself. And I told her how to use, this was actually many years ago, it was, it was a canopus box through, through a Firewire connection. Yeah. I thought, no way she's gonna pull it off. She somehow convinced everyone at the show to just give her a, a feed and was able to get you know, an analog feed into her laptop and stream the whole John Mayer concert like that and it got a surprising number of viewers. <laughs> That's awesome. Wow. I, it reminds me of the first time I ever webcast was uh, Firewire from a laptop uh, into, from the camera, so camera, Firewire, and literally the assistant was walking with the laptop <laughs> behind the camera. And then we had an ethernet, and it, this is like, you know, 2003, and uh, it worked really well. But I can't imagine doing that today. So. Um, I'm getting the wrap-up signal from my boss. So um, this was, I think the, the big takeaways right now um, are, you know, and it's kind of, I, I kind of got to the place I think where we got in our thread, which is don't forget about satellite, right? Don't think it's too expensive. Think about, you know, think about your client's needs, think about what your budget is obviously, right? But if you don't have internet, think about satellite. Um, Look into fiber. I've been very surprised at the times that I've found fiber available to me. Um, I, I go out with fiber for New Year's Eve. I do not trust anything but fiber on New Year's Eve. And it's, a, it's an excellent solution. It's one of these things where you turn it on and it just works. It's like so amazing. It's like so much better than the internet. And then, um, you know, look into live view and cellular bonding. Just be very careful and test, 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 test. Uh, redundancy. I want to thank my panel um, and I want to thank all of you for coming and um, thank you and happy streaming. Do we have, are we doing any <laughs> Q&A or? Uh, no, I don't, I think we don't That's have it. time. Gotcha. I, uh, we have zero, zero time. No worries. But uh, we'll be available after. Yes, we will answer any questions you have. Thank you so much for coming.